The Near Futurist, a podcast with Guy Clapperton. Hello, and thanks for downloading The Near Futurist, a show presented by me, Guy Clapperton. Technology was always supposed to make life easier for everyone. On an individual basis, many of us carry around our smartphones so we have everything in the same place, and it's all straightforward. On a corporate basis, everything was supposed to talk to everything else, so it became really, really easy. That makes sense, until we consider that even on a tiny micro basis, my phone came preloaded with the manufacturer's own music player, Deezer, and Google Music, and I wanted Spotify anyway. Then there's the step counter that always disagrees with my smartwatch, and don't even get me started about multiple calendar programs all on the same gadget. On a corporate level, I started writing about IT in January 1989, and I've made a decent living flogging the it's the end of the information silo story ever since. That's 30 years ago, give or take a couple of weeks. And I'm not the only person who's noticed that silos and information sprawl have been with us ever since. Matt Klassen from Sherwell Software has been looking at what effect going digital has had on companies. And he's joining me today from, I think, Las Vegas. Matt, thank you and welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me, Guy. You're more than welcome. First, perhaps you could tell us about yourself and your organization. Yeah, so I would actually describe myself as a student creator, an evangelist of software. So ever since I was a kid, through my studies in computer science, I've been fascinated about how software has the potential to change the way we live, the way we work, the way we interact in many ways. In fact, someone was I thought was very profound once described software as the closest man-made thing to human thought which was quite captivating to me and, uh, and motivating and interesting. So today, I work for Sherwell Software, and I get to think about and study challenges and trends in IT and, uh, and business as it relates to services, workflows, processes, and then how software can potentially play a role in solving those challenges um, through better automation. Okay. Now... On that theme, and also on the theme of my introduction, digital technology is supposed to make our lives an awful lot tidier. Now, I just looked at my desktop, and uh, the the software desktop, not the physical thing, which is just a wreck anyway, Uh, but I just looked at my desktop. It doesn't look terribly tidy to me, and uh, when I talk to people about the amount of data, the amount of data silos they've got, information silos, app silos, etc., whether because they've acquired companies, whether because it was badly designed in the first place or something else became available... What's gone wrong? It doesn't seem to be working, does it? Yeah, I mean, it's a good, good observation. And I think it's true both of physical and electronic desktops. And I think there's really kind of three components at work. And this is, you know, you've probably heard this before, but technology is really only one. People and process are the other two. And, and people tend to be, number one, averse to change. So even though there might be a, a better way, a more integrated way, they tend to stick with what they know. In addition, people tend... Uh, on that topic of tending to do what they know, they may not have the right skills to use the new technology. And so the second area would be process. A lot of times technology doesn't follow an intuitive process. It doesn't follow the right process. It's not efficient. Ultimately, that leads to failure as well. And then, uh, and then, and then very sp- specific to any machine, or in this case, a device or software, is the interface. What is the experience you're having when you use that software device? Is it better than the alternative? Is it better than using multiple pieces of software? Which, again, sort of leads to sprawl. And in fact, even even is a motivator for people to revert back to sort of manual or analog ways of doing things. Yes, I remember I spoke to a director once of a a major company. Uh, This is about the late 1990s, uh, so this isn't quite as ridiculous as it sounds. They'd adopted Microsoft Outlook, but he decided that he wanted to continue using a paper diary because then people would actually continue walking into his office and talking to him, whereas if it was all on computers, they would just sit there and type. Are those sort of obstructions perhaps an updated version? Are they still real, do you think? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, I think anybody has to kind of sort of look at a couple of different factors. So one is efficiency. There's clearly some efficiencies that can be gained. However, when you look at efficiency, you also need not look at efficiency for an individual. But if you're working within a company, you have to look at the group. You have to look at the team. You have to look at the organization, your function within the organization, and then the, and then the larger organization. I think people tend to think about themselves, not the others on the team, not the organization or the the specific business function, or and in, and in many instances, who owns looking at those processes, technologies across the organization, 
in terms of both the efficiency and then the other, other fact would be effectiveness. And I, th- I think a lot of times, again, people neglect to look at the bigger picture. I wonder also whether people look at the processes that they're doing at the moment and they assume that the, those same processes are going to be effective, but just a little faster when they use technology. Whereas actually sometimes when people, if you stick with the Microsoft Outlook example, it was only when people really used it to start collaborating rather than use it as a substitute for paper memos uh, that it's, it started to take off because it, 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 it became something else. I suppose it ultimately evolved into collaboration software. Do you think people get stuck thinking, I'm going to do this? The same thing but with this new tool absolutely absolutely so i mean there's there's several adages that uh have been coined one is you know a fool with the tool is simply a fool right with a tool if you will but um if you don't change the process if you don't think about how are we going to how is this going to enhance whatever the outcome is the objective you know i think you're i think you're falling short again just automating a broken process is sometimes actually leads to more magnification on the fact that the process is broken Right. So are we talking perhaps not just about technological change, but about cultural change within organizations? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, and I think so. So if you think of the organizational level, a lot of times, again, companies look at functions or processes or workflows within a particular business function. And that business function effectively is defined in a traditional manner. And so what happens is people are hired, they're trained, and they're paid to effectively do a very specific function, to fulfill a very specific role, and they're not really paid to think outside that role. I think that leads to a lot of the dysfunction in organizations because who is? Who is actually looking at how do we do things differently? And if you think about any any large-scale sort of disruptive impact in industry, it's because people completely threw away, somebody threw away the old, they, they threw away that anchor of that old traditional way of thinking and thought, how can we accomplish this goal in a completely different way, more innovative way using technology? So, I mean, a lot, a lot of those, you know, come to mind, obviously, like Netflix is a great example in terms of streaming media and actually even before that, changing the way in which you actually rented CDs, discs, if you will, um, DVDs. And, uh, and completely disrupted that, right? Amazon is a great example in, in the world of, of retail. So I think there's a lot of good examples where it changed entirely, the, the, the process underlying had to change entirely in order for that disruption to occur. And the other thing I think people do sometimes is they buy in something else, which is apparently supposed to sort all this stuff out. And uh, that means buying more technology, which actually, in terms of people not wanting to adopt new technology on the ground, I think you're right, the people are very important in that, just means there's yet another process or yet another silo. And it, if, it, if it doesn't become pervasive, it actually adds to the problem rather than does anything to help. Am I barking up the wrong tree? Is that something you've seen? No, it's absolutely correct. In fact, I think there was an interesting trend 10, 12 years ago that has really impacted this. And so in, in many ways, you know, this trend of software as a service has done great service, created great efficiencies within organizations. But if you think about it, you know, 12 to 15 years ago, you know, there was this sort of turning point at which if a, a function, a business function, in this case, let's just say sales or customer success or customer service within an organization, if they wanted to implement software, to manage the relationships of their customers, opportunities and leads, if you will, for new business. They had to go to IT to implement a very complex, lengthy process to implement software for them. And with the advent, I think that one of the larger ones that everybody sort of comes to mind for everyone is, is Salesforce, right? They had this big, they actually had this slogan, which, I, which is a bit wrong, but it was this word software with a big slash through it, that they weren't software, at least in the traditional sense. Of course, it was software, it was just running in the cloud. It was as a service. And I think what happened is a lot of organizations started buying into this concept. Hey, we don't have to go to IT. Uh, we don't have to spend these, these you know, many months and or years and all this money to implement. We can very rapidly adopt new technology. We, it's, it's just a service. We just sign up for it. And a day later, a little more than that, but a day later, effectively, you have, uh, or an hour later, a minute later, right? You have software running in the cloud somewhere. And all my salespeople, no matter where they are in the world, have access to this information and this, and this software. And we didn't need, we really effectively didn't need IT to help us. And so I think that's really propagated a really interesting trend where it's empowered the business to go out and solve their own problems 
But it also, if you think about it, right, they, they probably didn't go back and say, hey, I wonder if our process is broken. Yet another piece of software that's running in the cloud, right, as a service. And there's, in fact, there's a huge number. I've talked to a different couple of different companies that their business is kind of looking at all the traffic, network traffic that goes, goes in and out of the firewall within an organization. And they found that 80, over 80% of the SaaS applications used were not endorsed officially by IT. That means that either they were really rogue or a department or an individual, or maybe that, you know, again, one of those business functions just said, this is the right thing for us. We don't need to talk to IT. And so it's led to significant sprawl. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, this is where you get, I think those people things keep getting in the way again, but sometimes they may have a point. I've uh, certainly known family members and I'm not going to be any more specific than that. have uh, said to me that they've been told they may not use, for example, Dropbox, because at that point in the time it had some insecurities around about it, but then their own systems were down. So to get file A to file B, the view is very much, oh, who cares? We'll just use Dropbox. It's not going to do any harm, is it? And I think there's quite a lot of that, isn't there? Like we, we all feel very empowered about these computer things, which if we actually were to unscrew them and open them up, we'd be horrified at how complex they are. But we still think we actually understand them. Yeah, I think it, it adds to a lot, of, a lot of key challenges, with it, especially within the enterprise, right? It leads to sprawl, duplicative costs, inefficiencies, com- actually more complexity. I mean, people think it's simplicity, but it's actually more complexity. And in fact, what's interesting is analysts are also suggesting, for some recent conversations I've had with some uh, leading analysts, that, that the cost of keeping the lights on uh, within IT, right, software, servers, et cetera, is actually going up, not down, right? So the promise of cloud, the promise of <laughs> software as a service, et cetera, was supposed to reduce the cost, underlying cost of just operating uh, information technology and leave more money for innovation. And actually the opposite is happening today and partly because of that. It's not just the money, is it? I'm, I'm waiting for the report to come out that actually offsets the cost or the ecological cost, uh, the uh, environmental cost of running all these servers and keeping the lights on all the time as compared to all this travel that we're no longer doing. Because I, I just think, you know, people say, oh, it eliminates travel. It is therefore good. I'd like to know a little bit more sometimes about how much it actually costs that we all, uh, in environmental terms, that we all keep our phones charged overnight. We all have a smart device with us or several smart devices with us the whole time i suspect i don't know but i suspect the uh, the balance isn't perhaps as clear-cut as some people would make out yeah i would agree i think uh, in fact i'm i'm in las vegas because uh, i'm at a, at a conference called aws reinvent so of course aws is one of the largest cloud providers on earth and and what's interesting is we are now hearing from our customers who use this virtual tech cloud technology right instead of let's say a physical data center, that their costs aren't, one of the reasons their costs aren't going down, right, is because it's so easy to spin up virtual machines. And because it's not, it's not as a a physical machine didn't have to get installed in a server room, et cetera, et cetera. They spin up these virtual machines and they just leave them running indefinitely. And they're not even serving a purpose. And so somewhere there's energy being used. There's, (laughs) it's taking up space. There's a waste of resources, a waste of costs, and, and that's a huge problem within, within many organizations. Yes, I was talking to an IT manager in, uh, or an IT director in Paris just recently, and he was saying it's very easy to spin up a machine if you're, a, say, a non-technical user. But if you're head of a department or something, it's even easier to forget to spin it down again later. <laughs> because you, you know, the whole idea exactly. about cloud is you only use these things when you need them. Uh, but if you just use it and then forget it, it's still there. So yep. if you're yep. an IT manager, your IT director, that sort of position, where do you even begin to uh, sort this out? So I think that, you know, the first thing I think any, any IT manager sort of needs to think about is, is their organization at the right level of maturity and proficiency in service management? And, I, and I, again, we haven't been using this term in, in, this, in this podcast, service management, but in essence, when you start thinking about how does work get done within an organization? There's a very, very common pattern across the organization, and that is people make a request, and then it's fulfilled by somebody or something, right? It it could be a request of HR, it could be a request of IT, it could be a request. And this happens consistently, and and what that shows is that's just part of, right, processes, workflows, effectively, that need to be 
potentially automated, integrated, et cetera. But that, that whole realm, right, the concept is called service management. And so one of the things that we find is that IT actually has, in many organizations, either has, has already achieved a, a fairly high level of maturity in some of these key process areas in terms of resolving problems or challenges or meeting requests and, and providing services to the organization, or they have the potential because there's well-defined frameworks in place for IT to actually accomplish these things and become much more proficient and effective for the organization. Actually, so a lot of what we talked about could actually be solved by following some of these processes. So, so number one is, are you at the right level of maturity? And I say right because ultimately a lot of maturity curves, let's say they go from a scale of one to five, five may not be the right level. That may be actually wasteful. There may be a, a diminishing return. Uh, a lot of times three tends to be, depends on, again, the scale. But there's a lot of ways to sort of judge, are you at the right level of maturity and, and proficiency? And once you are, as an IT organization, I think IT actually holds a key here because a lot of what we talked about is these silos exist within the business in these, in these various functions. And it's natural that HR, for instance, is going to go purchase software to solve their own problems. They may look to IT to help them. They may do it on their own through purchasing SaaS or you know, services. But at the end of the day, what HR is probably not going to do is they're probably not going to take it upon themselves to figure out how to integrate that technology, that software across the entire organization to fundamentally change the way those organizations or those, those functional areas and roles collaborate to create something new and better. So a great example, I mean, just to make this sort of real, that we use a lot, I think everybody can sort of relate to is, is the concept of onboarding a new employee. Think about onboarding a new employee. Well, who owns the process? Well, you might say HR. And maybe they, maybe they are because they're the initiator, right? They're, the, they're the, the organization that's effectively in charge of keeping the records of employees, officially making offers, et cetera, the paperwork associated with bringing a new employee on board. But if you think about onboarding an employee, the goal is to very efficiently make ensure that the employee is productive, as productive as absolutely possible on day one. And yet, many, many, many organizations, that is not the case. It's very far from the case. And if you think about what's involved, there's a lot involved. In fact, it's probably one of the more pervasive processes, business processes that you think of, you could think of as a service, a shared service across the organization. So when you onboard a new employee, they need a desk. They probably need a chair. That might be a facilities thing. They need access to the building. That's security typically, right? There's a security group that's in charge of that. Could be under, under facilities. They need access to software. They need an ID. They need email. They need a computer. They might need a phone, right? That's typically IT. They need to be able to get a paycheck. That's payroll. And so even though HR may initiate the process, there's many, many other activities, if you will, deliverables, right, that have to be accomplished. And again, many times we see those are completely disconnected. Some of them are completely manual. Uh, some are literally paper-based forms people have to fill out after they get to the company on the day of orientation, which means there's a lag in being, becoming productive um, and gaining access to those resources that they need. And so anyway, that's just one example of, you know, who owns solving that problem. And my suggestion would be, you know, IT should play a significant role. Okay. And uh, if you're the end user or, or the, if you're the new employee stuck in the middle of all this, so is the answer just to be patient or to accept changes and not to resist changes that your employer has put in place, you know, just so that this sprawl doesn't happen? How, how can we help as individuals, do you think? So there's a couple couple pieces. First of all, there's the individuals within the company, right, that have already gone through this process, and many of which could and should be potentially empowered to solve it. Obviously, there's the employee being hired. And again, I think, I think you flip it around and you think about everything we do from an IT and technology perspective, we should be thinking about the experience from the end user's perspective. Again, we think about experience, a lot of times we think of consumer, consumer experience, but we can take that, those, those, cons, those same concepts and apply it to the new employee being hired. What is their experience? How, how can they very efficiently gain access? And then as we've all gone through the process as, as, as existing employees, again, we can kind of think through and in our role and how does that relate to others. But interestingly enough, there is, there is actually a trend in technology and this, there's a term, 
I've heard recently called citizen developer. And what does that mean? It sounds like a government thing. The reality is a citizen developer is simply somebody in the business who's been empowered to actually automate workflows and processes. And there's a, there's a whole new set of tools that are coming out. Some, some call them low code or no code. Uh, some call high productivity application development as a service, but that sort of empower the business to sort of better integrate, better automate processes. And I think, again, I think, you know, organizations can really, could really see some huge advances as they think about how they adopt platforms that allow them to easily automate and integrate processes across the organization and put that power in the hands of those that really understand those processes the employees, um, the new hires, et cetera. Yeah, and people who actually understand the processes rather than people who want to have a degree in computing and sit in front of a very complicated screen. I think that's, that, that's important. It is all about the experience, as you say. So where could listeners find out about what uh, Sherwell in particular offers? So, of course, they can go to Sherwell.com, C-H-E-R-W-E-L-L.com. Or a really good place is we, do, we tend to do a lot of webcasts or webinars on a platform called Bright Talk. And, and these are really just about not necessarily our technology as much as it is about how, you know, kind of our point of view, how we see customers solving these challenges, patterns, different ways of thinking about the problem and improving process. And that's a great place to go. Thank you very much. Matt Klassen of Sherwell Software, thank you very much for joining me. Thanks, Guy. Appreciate it. Many thanks to all of you for listening. That was the Near Futurist podcast with me, Guy Clapperton. Do have a look at my website at nearfuturist.co.uk where you'll find more episodes and information on what we're about. If you'd like to book me as a speaker or moderator of your technology event, do have a look and then get in touch with my agent whose details are on the site. Now, as I mentioned in the last episode, we're varying the every other week schedule of this podcast to accommodate the Christmas break. I Googled and apparently they won't move it for me. So this is the last episode of the year and we'll be back on Monday the 7th of January, when we'll all reluctantly be back in the office. What would I like for Christmas? I thought you'd never ask. If you like what you've heard on this podcast, except for that episode where I underestimated the background noise, of course, I'd really appreciate a review on the iTunes store, Acast, or wherever you get your podcast. It's apparently a good way of making these things grow. So a review would be nice, but we're all pushed for time, so I'd settle for your best wishes if you like, and I certainly send you mine. My name's Guy Clapperton. See you in 2019.